So tonight, I want to start off with a question for everybody. What's the one thing that we all have in common? Everyone in this room sitting here tonight. Actually, for that matter, everybody, every human being alive today. It's the one thread that we all have in common. Very few things these days where everybody is united in one front. Every one of us is going to get sick, and every one of us is going to die. So on that happy, bright note, <laughs> um, you know, think about Benjamin Franklin, uh, who said it best, the only true certainty in life are taxes and death. And it's very, very true. And you can look at that as a depressing thing. And you know, I make a joke about that. I actually see it as a positive. I see it as a uniting feature that brings people together. I've treated people literally from around the world, different cultures, different countries, different orientations, different languages. It's, oh, we're all sick. And everybody's in that same place. Money won't save you. Connections won't save you. Whatever country you live in is not going to save you. It, it's, a, it's a unifying and very powerful thing. So where are we in healthcare today? Innovation, technology, you can't drive down the street and not see a billboard about we're curing this, we're curing that, the TV commercials. Innovation, technology, for the first time in the history, history of modern medicine, going back to, to the Greek ages, we have technology that we don't know what to do with for the very first time. It wasn't that long ago, I'm an old guy, but it wasn't that long ago when I remember looking at patients being in an operating room, being in an interventional suite, and saying, I could just see that part of the brain non-invasively so I, I, I know that I can get there safely. If I could just get a catheter up to this little vessel. Those days are gone. I mean, to put that in context, today, this is reality. Using smart technology on an iPhone, you can diagnose a stroke using face recognition. Not only that, it can call 911. When 911 is called, the hospital can be alerted. The hospital's alerted, a team is mobilized. The team is mobilized, a patient gets on a CAT scan. Artificial intelligence reads the CAT scan, reads the CAT scan with a 99.99% accuracy. And at two o'clock in the morning, my phone dings and it says there's a patient with a stroke, they have an ischemic penumbra, which we're gonna talk about, and we need to mobilize the team. So all that's great, but are we for where we should be? Are we further along than we were 10 years ago, 20 years ago, 50 years ago? Think about that. I want to talk about neurosciences. So let's think about diseases like stroke, brain tumors, high-grade gliomas of the brain, Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, ALS or Lou Gehrig's disease. Everyone's familiar with these diseases, and most of the people listening to this probably either know someone or suffering from one of them themselves. And Let's think about those diseases and think with everything that I just said, where are we today? Well, let's start with stroke. So you guys didn't realize, guys and gals, that you're going to get an honorary brain surgery degree at the end of this talk. I'm going to teach you everything you need to know about stroke in 30 seconds on the slide, and I'm not kidding. So imagine that's the gray there is a normal brain, and imagine that area with the gold ring and the white in the center that there's an artery going to feed that area of the brain. All the gray is normal blood supply. It's all of us sitting in the room today, I hope. As that blood supply starts to go down, that's where you see that yellow area. That's what's called an ischemic penumbra. Why is that important? That's critically important because that area, if that blood vessel continues to stay narrowed, or there's, let's imagine there's a clot in there, those cells are gonna die. But right now, they're on the fence. We can open that artery and restore blood in a timely fashion. We can turn that back to gray. So let's think about what that means. Let's talk about a patient that that area is in the left side of their brain. What that's going to affect, they're going to lose their speech. They're not going to understand what anybody's saying to them. It's going to sound like uh, the Peanuts characters. And for the young people, you don't know what that is, but the older people know what that is. Wah, 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 wah. That's what you'll hear. And you won't be able to move the right side of your body. If we can open that artery up, everything reverses. It's the most incredible thing that you'll see in medicine. The center is dead tissue. That's tissue that's just been sitting for too long without blood supply. That's stroke in a nutshell. So you might be surprised to know that about 40 years ago, we could do special CAT scans that would tell me that exact thing. A patient could come in, didn't matter what time the stroke started, could tell me what brain I can save and what brain I can't. I can also tell you about 30 years ago, we had the technology and devices 
they weren't perfect, but the ability to open those arteries up took 30 years, 30 years to get us today where we can do that. And I will tell you, in the last five years is the first time where we're actually triaging patients, getting them in there, and there's a lot of places still where a patient will show up with a stroke, be sitting in an emergency room, time's wasted, and that yellow goes to white. And, and to put it in context, every 40 seconds, someone in this country is going to have a stroke. Every four minutes, actually less than four minutes, someone's going to die in this country of a stroke. Number one disability and uh, cause of death in the US. So I would argue that we're not that far along. But the thing I want to focus on is the technology that we knew 30 years ago. Why did it take this long? So let's shift gears a little bit. So let's talk about brain tumors. High-grade gliomas, uh, glioblastoma multiforme. It's, it's, it's a technical term. It's a grade four glioma of the brain. It's the most malignant brain tumor, most malignant disease that you can have. Um, I treat a lot of patients with that. And we have a lot of technology out there. The average median life expectancy from the time of diagnosis today 6.6 .6 months. My colleagues hate when I go to our conferences and I, I, I beat on all of us, myself included for that, 6.6 .6 months. Have we made some strides? We have, but nowhere near where we should be. Now some of you may remember this. This is a young girl, uh, Brittany Maynard. She was diagnosed 29 years old, 29 years old with this brain tumor. She made the decision to take her own life because she met with doctors, she met with oncologists, she met with surgeons, she researched it, and she said, this is what my life's gonna be with treatments, this is where the outcome is now, I'm gonna take control of my own life. That's a really sad statement for me and my profession. This wasn't that long ago. So why is that? Why is it with all the technology and everywhere, everything that we've gotten is in, in, in relation to treatment of disease, gene therapy, it's not just devices and artificial uh, uh, intelligence, it's understanding how the brain works. We understand how the brain works m now more than ever because of imaging. You can do an MRI on somebody, have them on the table talking and I can see where all the fibers are, I can, I can understand why de for depression, somebody has a tremor from Parkinson's disease, we know the areas of the brain, we understand the functions much better. So why are we still here? Let's think about one thing. There's one thing during the pandemic with all the horror that really, really struck me and still does. We came up with a vaccine in months. Does everyone remember that? Everyone in this room remembers that. You remember when, when the, we first realized that the coronavirus was here and real? And it was all about the vaccine. And the experts said, years, we don't even understand how it works. We need approval. We need, we need all of these things. So to put it in context, influenza, Smallpox, polio, took decades, decades to come up with that virus, uh, I'm sorry, vaccine. So for the coronavirus, we came up with a vaccine in months. And we distributed it to, to this day to billions of people. I think we're up to eight or nine billion people globally. So why is that? Why can't we apply that technology to disease and these types of diseases? Well, see, this is where the, the, the good part comes in. This is where we're, we're going to talk about how we're going to do this and why we need to do this and why every person, every patient needs to be a proponent and push this. This is the problem. This is why we aren't able to do that and we haven't been able to do that with these other diseases because we're in silos. Medicine and healthcare is in silos and every single person, whether you're going to a pediatrician visit with your child, you're going yourself, or you're taking a family member to the doctor. Doctors don't communicate, departments don't communicate, and I'll tell you as a physician, it frustrates us too. And in the neurosciences, it is critically important. Neurosciences isn't neurosurgery. If you ask 10 people, I ask my colleagues all the time, what do you think neurosciences is? You know, the surgeons was neurosurgery, it's this, uh, the neurologist, it's neurology, it's psychiatry. It's yes to all of that, but we have to even go further. Neurology, neurosurgery, psychiatry, mental health, engineering, plastic surgery. That's a whole other TED talk where I can talk about how plastic surgery fits into stuff we're doing in the brain. Um, these are critically important silos to break down because we need to get everybody together just like the virus. Why did you see up in the left-hand corner the biggest silo of all? 
Who came up with the cure for the vaccine? Industry did. Be really clear about that. It wasn't NIH, it wasn't the large academic Ivy League institutions. Yes, it was a team effort. Industry came up. They were charged to do it, and they did it, because industry has the brightest, the best, the money, the technology. This is what they do every day, all the time. So we need to bring all of these things together and have that same focus, that same fight for these diseases as we did for the, the uh, uh, coronavirus. And I think we also need to look at how we're training our next generation of healthcare providers. And when I say healthcare providers, I think that's broadened. I consider engineers, I consider basic scientists, I consider everybody that has anything to do with healthcare. So I want, I want to also put something in perspective. The doubling of knowledge, there's a concept of doubling of knowledge of how as, as society has evolved, but within medicine, how long it takes to double your knowledge. In the 1950s, if you were a physician, it took 50 years for you to double your knowledge. That's how slow things were. In the 80s, it was seven and a half years. 2010, three years. 20, um, it was uh, 18 months, and where we are now is months. And it depends how you do it, but we're months. Doubling of knowledge within months. So there's no way that you can know everything for everybody. So when we train students, we need to get them to understand what they're doing and what their love and their passion is and get them together with all these other silos. And let me give you an example, engineering students. Engineering students, kids that are going into biomechanical engineering, they don't see patients. So these are people that are passionate about coming up with the next device that's gonna save lives. That's what they wanna do, that's what they study, that's what they do. They don't see one patient in an office, they never go to the operating room, they don't talk to physicians, they don't talk to healthcare providers. That doesn't make any sense, it makes zero sense. We started a program called Engineers and Scrubs to bring them in. I lectured to, to a lot of the engineering schools and the questions they were asking, I was like, wow, you need to be here, see what we're doing so we can start working together. Something that simple. Everybody is, from the time they're studying medicine, engineering, basic science, they're in these silos. And then it just continues on. So we need to break those walls down at an education level really early. So I, I, I kind of teased you with we have the answer. So what, you know, everything that I just said, let's think about how do we do this? How do we do it in a simple or, or, or a, a kind of organized way that isn't gonna take 50 years because we don't have 50 years. I don't have 50 years and most of us in this audience don't have 50 years. What if we had a place, imagine a place where Brittany Maynard could go when she had her diagnosis. Not a hospital, not a healthcare facility, not some place in Europe that specializes in some weird treatment or, or, or trial, but she could walk through the door, a place that looked like this that had all those silos together, pharmacy, device companies, engineers, innovators. Elon Musk started Neuralink. He's, he's flying people to the, to the moon, uh, putting them into space. And his next frontier is this, because he sees how low frank, hanging fruit this is. Imagine getting all those people, the brightest and the best, with no walls, no silos, everybody walks through that door with the same ID badge, and we're all together, meeting every day, seeing patients, and working together. Think about that, it's not that complicated. This doesn't exist. I'll tell you this doesn't exist. And I've spent the last 10 years of my life with people a lot smarter than me to make this a reality. Because this is the future of healthcare. This is where we need to be. This is what we need to demand as patients. And the very first thing that comes up the very first thing that comes up, you can't put industry in a hospital. There's conflict. There's, the doctors are gonna get paid off and people are gonna lose sight. Is that true? Yes, absolutely it can be true. But if every physician, every healthcare provider that walks in there has zero, 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 zero conflict, can't get a cup of coffee bought for them, zero conflict. And when you walk in, there's a digital board that says, hey, I'm going to see Dr. Vez. What are Dr. Vez's relationships with Zero. It's not, it's not hard, it's not complicated, it really isn't. You bring everybody together and great things happen. I've been giving this pitch, again, for a decade of my life, but not until the pandemic 
was able to use an example. And nobody can argue with that. Nobody can argue with that. There was a, a, a real force that needed to happen at a global scale that none of us will ever see again. We need to apply that to our healthcare. Now imagine that this is five blocks away from where we're standing. Imagine that this is in a community, not in downtown Manhattan, not in you know, center city Philip. Imagine this is in a community where it is accessible to everybody from the main line to New York City, to Paris, to Chester County. Imagine getting kids who look at hospitals as a really scary place where people go to die. And imagine having them come in there as kids and seeing, I can be an engineer. This is what a doctor does. This is what a radiology technician does. This is what a nurse does. Wow, this isn't scary. This is really cool. Think about that. This, this touches many, many points. So with that, I will leave it up to everybody else to help this become a reality. Thank you.